Good morning. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to have you with us. My name is Morgan Freeman. I'm one of the members of Village Church. And this morning we're continuing in our series of going through Romans chapter 8. Today we'll be looking at verses 22 to 25. If you've got a Bible, you'll find it helpful to have it open on this passage as I go through. But before I start, let me just pray and ask for God's help. Father Lord, I pray now that you help me to preach faithfully and clearly. I pray, Lord, that you help us to see the truths from these verses. And I pray that the Spirit will be working in our hearts and minds, or that it would change us, or that we would know how to respond. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's 6am on a Saturday morning, first day of the school summer holidays. I've just got into the car with my sister, mum and dad, and we're on the way to St Ives in Cornwall from Regen, South Wales. I'm so excited, I can't wait to be on the beach digging holes, making the biggest ever sandcastle. I've got my bodyboard down in front of my legs, it's going to be so fun going in the sea. I scream every day, maybe twice if I'm a good boy. And I might even put my feet up and catch some rays. Holiday, here I come. It's now 7am and we're on the motorway. We've only just gone over the Severn Bridge. Mum, are we there yet? No, not yet, Morgan. 7.15. Mum, are we there yet? Does it look like we are? No, not yet. 7.20. Dad, are we there yet? Because he might give me a different answer. No, it's going to be a little while. Sit patiently, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. The passage we are looking at this week starts at verse 22. Let's jump straight in. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. We saw this last week. Verse 20, creation was subjected to frustration by God, but in hope, verse 21, that it will one day be freed from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Creation is frustrated, it has suffered and is suffering. Verse 19, creation is waiting in eager expectation for us. Well, we may have expected us to be waiting for creation to be freed, it's the other way around. Creation is waiting for us to be children of God, it is waiting for us to be glorified with Christ. And this helps explain the end of verse 22 for us. Creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Now, giving birth is something I'm glad I'll never have to do myself. To use the words as a verse, we all know that it is painful. But we also know that women go through pregnancy and labour because of the joy and hope of bringing a new child into this world. They persevere through the pain for what is to come. And Paul is using this illustration to describe what creation is going through. Perhaps this helps paint the picture of how strong the groaning of creation is. This is not just a, oh, uh, or a sigh from a teenager, or an adult, we all do it. No, Paul says it is like the pain of childbirth. And briefly, what does this look like? Well, Paul's probably drawn from a verse in Mark, describing the end times. Mark 13 verse 8 says this, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are the beginnings of the birth pains. This is what creation is going through today. Creation is still groaning in this present time, and it will do until the children of God are revealed. But creation waits with eager expectation and in hopefulness. But it's not just creation that is groaning or waiting. Verses 23 to 25 switches from creation to us. And these are the verses we're going to focus on today. I've got four points to help us guide, to help guide us through. Before you panic and think four points, it's going to be a long sermon. I should have made a stronger coffee. If you know me, I'm a man of few words. But stay with me just for the next ten minutes or so. Here's my first point. Point one: Who groans? Point two: 
1.1 who groans. Paul tells the Roman church that we ourselves groan inwardly. On first thought, you might think Paul's just referring to all people. We all suffer in this world, right? Everyone would say this world is not perfect. Suffering is painful and frustrating. We all long for there to be none of it. But Paul is more specific on who the we is in verse 23. It is those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. And those who have the first fruits of the Spirit are Christians. That is, those who believe in God and have a relationship with him. We've seen earlier in this chapter that to be a Christian, you must have the Spirit. You cannot have the Spirit and not be a Christian, and therefore you cannot be a Christian and not have the Spirit. The two are inseparable. So point one, who groans? That is, Christians. I said it wouldn't be long. Point two, why do we groan? Point two, why do we groan? So Paul tells us those who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Christians, groan inwardly. Why are we groaning? Well, because we are suffering. Look back at verse 17 with me. Christians, as children of God, will share in his, that is Christ's, sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I'll touch more on the glory in point three, but hopefully we can see here Paul making clear that the Christian will suffer and have times of pain and difficulty and sadness. As Johnny preached to us last week, this is an important point Paul is making. Just in case the readers at the time didn't get it in verse 17 to 18, Paul makes this point again at verse 23 by saying, not only so, not only creation, not only creation suffers, but we too. Being a Christian, putting your trust in Christ's grace and mercy and sacrifice does not and will not give you an easy life. Let's get that idea far out of our minds. A stronger faith will not lead to less illness and sadness. In fact, we know from other passages that being a Christian may well lead to more suffering through persecution. And of course, we groan as we continue in the battle against sin. Paul has urged us to put to death the misdeeds of the body. And in this age, with the help of the Spirit, we must continue to fight sin. Yes, we long for that day when the battle will be over, when we will have victory and have life to the full. But for now, we must keep our armour on and fight on. But it's not just what we are going through that causes us to groan. It is knowing what is to come. We are looking forward to something much better. Like a child longing for Christmas to come again, or to use Paul's illustration, like a pregnant woman longing for labour to be over and her child to be in her arms. We grow now as we wait eagerly for something more, something better. Eagerly, we are looking forward to it. Nobody waits eagerly for something they don't want. And so looking forward to what is to come is and should be a mark of every child of God. If we're happy and content with this life and this earth as it is, then... Something is not right there. Christian groaning is for something much better. We have just the first fruits of the Spirit now. We have only tasted the pre-dinner canapes. There is much more to come. The turkey is on its way. And so point three, what do we groan for? Point three, what do we groan for? Verse 23, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. This is what we are waiting for, our adoption and redemption in its fullness. Through the Spirit, this is guaranteed. Paul has already told us this just a few verses ago. Look at the second half of verse 15. The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And verse 11. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, 
We are not waiting or hoping with optimism. This is not like entering a lottery hoping your numbers might come up. No, this is like running the Marathon World Championships knowing you will win. You just have to finish. We are waiting with confidence and so we can wait eagerly. It will come one day, not might. It will be worth the wait. Just to be clear here, Paul is not contradicting himself here and saying that we are not already children of God. We are adopted. Verse 15 makes that point. We are legally adopted. Christ has paid the price on the cross, but the full experience of adoption is not yet. While we're on this imperfect earth, we know it is not quite right. There is more to come. Our adoption in its fullness will come on that great day when we share in Christ's glory. And so too with our bodies. These mortal bodies we have today will one day die. That is obvious. But we look forward with confidence to the day when we will have a new body. Verse 24, this is the hope we have. Who hopes for what they already have? Nobody does. We hope for what we do not yet have. We've already seen that Paul in this passage is talking about Christians groaning. And what I've just said is what Christians groan for. And so I'm afraid this does mean that if you're not a Christian, whilst you may groan about the difficulties you face in life, I'm afraid you groan with no hope. You cannot have any confidence of anything better to come. This is it. You'll miss out unless you turn to God and put your trust in him and in Christ's death and resurrection. If this is you, can I urge you to really think about this? Don't let this just be another sermon gone by. But for Christians, Christians who have this great hope, how do we respond? Point four, what do we do now? What do we do now? How are we to respond to these truths? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We hope with faith in God's promises of what is to come, the promise of redemption of our bodies and adoption in its fullness. And we wait. Do you notice how many times Paul has used the word wait or hope in these recent verses? Let's have a look. Verse 19, creation waits. Verse 20, creation is subject to frustration, but in hope it is waiting. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves wait eagerly. Verse 24, hope is mentioned four times. We don't wait for what we already have. And verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. What do you think Paul is trying to tell us here? If you had one of those word clouds where everyone gives their answer to a question and the answers get, that get put forward the most appear biggest in the word cloud, wait, waiting and hope would be the word, biggest words right in the centre by far. So we wait for it eagerly and patiently until that day comes. It will be worth the wait as verse 17 says, our present sufferings, including our battle with sin, is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So, if you're a Christian, be excited for what is to come, what is promised. Let's encourage each other in this, to persevere in faith through what it is we are going through. Oh, what an encouragement it is to the church when we see a member persevering through the suffering they are going through with eyes fixed on Jesus. Oh, what an encouragement it is to see members of village come together to pray together to God in the midst of our suffering and groaning. Oh, what an encouragement it is to see each other at home group, even on Zoom, helping one another persevere in the suffering we each go through as we eagerly wait for something better to come. And oh, what an encouragement it is to see brothers and sisters in Christ put to death the misdeeds of the body 
and mature as Christians while we wait. As a church, we will grow. How long, Lord, bring us home. We are looking forward to that great day. So let's encourage each other regularly in these ways and others. God will not leave us alone. He will help us by the Spirit, as we will hear about next week. But also through his word. Chapter 15, verse 4 tells us, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. God has given us his word to encourage us and to teach us patient endurance. Hopefully earlier on you would have seen a short video on hope by the Bible Project. Did you catch what it said at the end? Biblical hope is not optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God, to bring about a future that is as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. It's now eight o'clock on my car journey to St Ives. Mum, are we there yet? Morgan, not quite. How long, Mum? I don't know. But every time you ask, we are closer. Be patient. We will be there soon. It will be worth the wait. Let's take a moment of quiet now. Let me pray before our last song. Heavenly Father, we do not know how long we must wait. Lord, we know that we are waiting with confidence. We can wait eagerly. And we pray you help us to wait patiently for the adoption uh, to be your children fully, Lord, and to have those new bodies. Lord, we were made Christ-like uh, and be with you. Lord, we long for that day when we will share in your glory. And we pray, Lord, that we'd encourage each other to wait patiently and eagerly for that day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.